Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is The White Wolf of the Hearts Mountains by H. D. Marriott, originally published in 1839. This story has the unusual distinction of featuring the first female werewolf in English literature. I guess that's something of a spoiler, but most of you already saw it coming. It's a wintry, spooky, dark tale. So now, let's open our imaginations and begin. My father was not born or originally a resident in the Hartz Mountains. He was the serf of a Hungarian nobleman of great possessions in Transylvania. But, although a serf, he was not by any means a poor or illiterate man. In fact, he was rich, and his intelligence and respectability were such that he had been raised by his lord to the stewardship. But, whoever may happen to be born a serf, a serf must he remain, even though he become a wealthy man. Such was the condition of my father. My father had been married for about five years, and, by his marriage, had three children, my eldest brother Caesar, myself, Herman, and a sister named Marcella. Latin is still the language spoken in that country, and that will account for our high-sounding names. My mother was a very beautiful woman, unfortunately more beautiful than virtuous. She was seen and admired by the lord of the soil. My father was sent away upon some mission, and, during his absence, my mother, flattered by the attentions and won by the assiduities of this nobleman, yielded to his wishes. It so happened that my father returned very unexpectedly and discovered the intrigue. The evidence of my mother's shame was positive. He surprised her in the company of her seducer. Carried away by the impetuosity of his feelings, he watched the opportunity of a meeting taking place between them and murdered both his wife and her seducer. Conscious that, as a serf, not even the provocation which he had received would be allowed as a justification of his conduct, he hastily collected together what money he could lay his hands upon, and, as we were then in the depth of winter, he put his horses to the sleigh, and taking his children with him, he set off in the middle of the night, and was far away before the tragical circumstance had transpired. Aware that he would be pursued, and that he had no chance of escape if he remained in any portion of his native country in which the authorities could lay hold of him, he continued his flight without intermission until he had buried himself in the intricacies and seclusion of the Hearts Mountains. Of course, all that I have now told you I learned afterwards. My oldest recollections are knit to a rude yet comfortable cottage in which I lived with my father, brother, and sister. It was on the confines of one of those vast forests which cover the northern part of Germany, and around it were a few acres of ground, which, during the summer months, my father cultivated, and which, though they yielded a doubtful harvest, were sufficient for our support. In the winter we remained much indoors, for, as my father followed the chase, we were left alone, and the wolves, during that season, incessantly prowled about. My father had purchased the cottage, and land about it, of one of the rude foresters, who gained their livelihood partly by hunting, and partly by burning charcoal, for the purpose of smelting the ore from the neighboring mines. It was distant about two miles from any other habitation. I can call to mind the whole landscape now the tall pines which rose up in the mountain above us, and the wide expanse of forest beneath, on the topmost boughs and heads of whose trees we looked down from our cottage, as the mountain below us rapidly descended into the distant valley. In summertime the prospect was beautiful, but during the severe winter a more desolate scene could not well be imagined. I said that, in the winter, my father occupied himself with the chase, Every day he left us, and often would he lock the door that we might not leave the cottage. He had no one to assist him or to take care of us. Indeed, it was not easy to find a female servant who would live in such a solitude. But, 
Could he have found one, my father would not have received her, for he had imbibed a horror of the sex, as difference of his conduct toward us, his two boys, and to my poor little sister, Marcella, evidently proved. You may suppose we were sadly neglected. Indeed, we suffered much, for my father, fearful that we might come to some harm, would not allow us fuel when he left the cottage, and we were obliged, therefore, to creep under the heaps of bear skins, and there to keep ourselves as warm as we could until he returned in the evening, when a blazing fire was our delight. That my father chose this restless sort of life may appear strange, but the fact was that he could not remain quiet, whether from remorse for having committed murder, or from the misery consequent on his change of situation, or from both combined. He was never happy unless he was in a state of activity. Children, however, when left much to themselves, acquire a thoughtfulness not common to their age. So it was with us, and during the short, cold days of winter we would sit silent, longing for the happy hours when the snow would melt, and the leaves burst out, and the birds begin their songs, and when we should again be set at liberty. Such was our peculiar and savage sort of life, until my brother Caesar was nine, myself seven, and my sister five years old, when the circumstances occurred on which is based the extraordinary narrative which I am about to relate. One evening my father returned home rather later than usual. He had been unsuccessful, and, as the weather was very severe and many feet of snow were upon the ground, he was not only very cold, but in a very bad humor. He had brought in wood, and we were all three of us gladly assisting each other in blowing on the embers to create the blaze when he caught poor little Marcella by the arm and threw her aside. My brother ran to raise her up. Accustomed to ill usage, and afraid of my father, she did not dare to cry, but looked up in his face very piteously. My father drew his stool nearer the hearth, muttered something in abuse of women, and busied himself with the fire, which both my brother and I had deserted when our sister was so unkindly treated. A cheerful blaze was soon the result of his exertions, but we did not, as usual, crowd around it. Marcella retired to a corner, and my brother and I took our seats beside her, while my father hung over the fire gloomily and alone. Such had been our position for about half an hour, when the howl of a wolf, close under the window of the cottage, fell on our ears. My father started up and seized his gun. The howl was repeated. He examined the priming, and then hastily left the cottage, shutting the door after him. We all waited, anxiously listening, for we thought that if he succeeded in shooting the wolf, he would return in a better humor, and although he was harsh to all of us, and particularly so to our little sister, still we loved our father, and loved to see him cheerful and happy, for what else had we to look up to? And I may here observe that perhaps there never were three children who were fonder of each other. We did not, like other children, fight and dispute together. And if, by chance, any disagreement did arise between my elder brother and me, little Marcella would run to us and, kissing us both, seal, through her entreaties, the peace between us. Marcella was a lovely, amiable child. I can recall her beautiful features even now. Alas, poor little Marcella. We waited for some time, but the report of the gun did not reach us, and my elder brother then said, our father has followed the wolf and will not be back for some time. Marcella, let us wash your face, and then we will leave this corner and go to the fire and warm ourselves. We did so, and remained there until near midnight, every minute wondering, as it grew later, why our father did not return. We had no idea that he was in any danger, but we thought he must have chased the wolf for a very long time. I will look out and see if father is coming said my brother Caesar, going to the door. Take care, said Marcella. The wolves must be about now, and we cannot kill them, brother. My brother opened the door very cautiously, and but a few inches. He peeped out. I see nothing, said he, after a time, and once more he joined us at the fire. We have had no supper, said I, for my father usually cooked the meat as soon as he came home, 
and during his absence we had nothing but the fragments of the preceding day. And if our father comes home after his hunt, Caesar, said Marcella, he will be pleased to have some supper. Let us cook it for him and for ourselves. Caesar climbed upon the stool and reached down some meat. I forget now whether it was venison or bear's meat, but we cut off the usual quantity and proceeded to dress it as we used to do under our father's superintendence. We were all busied putting it into the platters before the fire to await his coming when we heard the sound of a horn. We listened. There was a noise outside, and a minute afterwards my father entered, ushering in a young female and a large, dark man in a hunter's dress. Perhaps I had better now relate what was only known to me many years afterwards. When my father had left the cottage, he perceived a large white wolf about thirty yards from him. As soon as the animal saw my father, it retreated slowly, growling and snarling. My father followed. The animal did not run, but always kept at some distance, and my father did not like to fire until he was pretty certain that his ball would take effect. Thus they went on for some time, the wolf now leaving my father far behind, and then stopping and snarling defiance at him, and then again, on his approach, setting off at speed. Anxious to shoot the animal, for the white wolf is very rare, my father continued in the pursuit for several hours, during which he continually ascended the mountain. You must know that there are peculiar spots on those mountains which are supposed, and, as my story will prove, truly supposed, to be inhabited by the evil influences. They are well known to the huntsmen, who invariably avoid them. Now, one of those spots, an open space in the pine forests above us, had been pointed out to my father as dangerous on that account. But, whether he disbelieved these wild stories, or whether, in his eager pursuit of the chase, he disregarded them, I know not. Certain, however, it is that he was decoyed by the white wolf to this open space, when the animal appeared to slacken her speed. My father approached, came close up to her, raised his gun to his shoulder, and was about to fire when the wolf suddenly disappeared. He thought that the snow on the ground must have dazzled his sight, and he let down his gun to look for the beast, but she was gone. How she could have escaped over the clearance without his seeing her was beyond his comprehension. Mortified at the ill success of his chase, he was about to retrace his steps when he heard the distant sound of a horn. Astonishment at such a sound, at such an hour, in such a wilderness, made him forget for the moment his disappointment, and he remained riveted to the spot. In a minute the horn was blown a second time, and at no great distance. My father stood still and listened. A third time it was blown. I forget the term used to express it, but it was the signal which, my father well knew, implied that the party was lost in the woods. In a few minutes more, my father beheld a man on horseback, with a female seated on the crupper, enter the cleared space and ride up to him. At first my father called to mind the strange stories which he had heard of the supernatural beings who were said to frequent these mountains, but the nearer approach of the party satisfied him that they were mortals like himself. As soon as they came up to him, the man who guided the horse accosted him. Friend Hunter, you are out late, the better fortune for us. We have ridden far and are in fear of our lives, which are eagerly sought after. These mountains have enabled us to elude our pursuers, but if we find not shelter and refreshment, that will avail us little, as we must perish from hunger and the inclemency of the night. My daughter, who rides behind me, is now more dead than alive. Say, can you assist us in our difficulty? My cottage is some few miles distant, replied my father. But I have little to offer you besides a shelter from the weather. To the little I have, you are welcome. May I ask whence you come? Yes, friend, it is no secret now. We have escaped from Transylvania, where my daughter's honor and my life were equally in jeopardy. This information was quite enough to raise an interest in my father's heart. He remembered his own escape, 
he remembered the loss of his wife's honor and the tragedy by which it wound up. He immediately and warmly offered all the assistance which he could afford them. There is no time to be lost then, good sir, observed the horseman. My daughter is chilled with the frost and cannot hold out much longer against the severity of the weather. Follow me, replied my father, leading the way towards his home. I was lured away in pursuit of a large white wolf, observed my father. It came to the very window of my hut, or I should not have been out at this time of night. The creature passed by us just as we came out of the wood, said the female in a silvery tone. I was nearly discharging my piece at it, observed the hunter. But since it did us such good service, I am glad I allowed it to escape. In about an hour and a half, during which my father walked at a rapid pace, the party arrived at the cottage and, as I said before, came in. We are in good time, apparently, observed the dark hunter, catching the smell of the roasted meat as he walked into the fire and surveyed my brother, my sister, and myself. You have young cooks here, mynheer. I'm glad we shall not have to wait, replied my father. Come, mistress, seat yourself by the fire. You require warmth after your cold ride. And where can I put up my horse, mynheer? Observed the huntsman. I will take care of him, replied my father, going out of the cottage door. The female must, however, be particularly described. She was young and apparently twenty years of age. She was dressed in a traveling dress, deeply bordered with white fur, and wore a cap of white ermine on her head. Her features were very beautiful, at least I thought so, and so my father has since declared. Her hair was flaxen, glossy and shining, and bright as a mirror, and her mouth, although somewhat large when it was open, showed the most brilliant teeth I have ever beheld. But there was something about her eyes, bright as they were, which made us children afraid. They were so restless, so furtive. I could not at that time tell why, but I felt as if there was cruelty in her eye, and when she beckoned us to come to her, we approached her with fear and trembling. Still, she was beautiful, very beautiful. She spoke kindly to my brother and myself, petted our heads, and caressed us, but Marcella would not come near her. On the contrary, she slunk away and hid herself in the bed and would not wait for the supper, which half an hour before she had been so anxious for. My father, having put the horse into a close shed, soon returned, and supper was placed upon the table. When it was over, my father requested that the young lady would take possession of his bed, and he would remain at the fire and sit up with her father. After some hesitation on her part, this arrangement was agreed to, and I and my brother crept into the other bed with Marcella, for we had as yet always slept together. But we could not sleep. There was something so unusual, not only in seeing strange people, but in having these people sleep at the cottage, that we were bewildered. As for poor little Marcella, she was quiet, but I perceived that she trembled during the whole night, and sometimes I thought she was checking a sob. My father had brought out some spirits, which he rarely used, and he and the strange hunter remained drinking and talking before the fire. Our ears were ready to catch the slightest whisper, so much was our curiosity excited. You said you came from Transylvania? observed my father. Even so, mine here, replied the hunter. I was a serf to the noble house of Blank. My master would insist upon my surrendering up my fair girl to his wishes. It ended in my giving him a few inches of my hunting knife. We are countrymen and brothers in misfortune, replied my father, taking the huntsman's hand and pressing it warmly. Indeed, are you then from that country? Yes, and I too have fled for my life, but mine is a melancholy tale. Your name? inquired the hunter. Krantz. What? Krantz of blank? I have heard your tale, and you need not renew your grief by repeating it now. 
welcome, most welcome, mine here, and, I may say, my worthy kinsman. I am your second cousin, Wilfred of Barnsdorf, cried the hunter, rising up and embracing my father. They filled their horn mugs to the brim and drank to one another after the German fashion. The conversation was then carried on in a low tone. All that we could collect from it was that our new relative and his daughter were to take up their abode in our cottage, at least for the present. In about an hour they both fell back in their chairs and appeared to sleep. Marcella, did you hear? said my brother in a low tone. Yes, replied Marcella in a whisper. I heard all. Oh, brother, I cannot bear to look upon that woman. I feel so frightened. My brother made no reply, and shortly afterwards we were all three fast asleep. When we awoke the next morning, we found that the hunter's daughter had risen before us. I thought she looked more beautiful than ever. She came up to little Marcella and caressed her. The child burst into tears and sobbed as if her heart would break. But, not to detain you with too long a story, the huntsman and his daughter were accommodated in the cottage. My father and he went out hunting daily, leaving Christina with us. She performed all the household duties, was very kind to us children, and, gradually, the dislike of even little Marcella wore away. But a great change took place in my father. He appeared to have conquered his aversion to the sex, and was most attentive to Christina. Often, after her father and we were in bed, he would sit up with her, conversing in a low tone by the fire. I ought to have mentioned that my father and the huntsman Wilfred slept in another portion of the cottage, and that the bed which he formerly occupied, and which was in the same room as ours, had been given up to the use of Christina. These visitors had been about three weeks at the cottage when, one night, after we children had been sent to bed, a consultation was held. My father had asked Christina in marriage, and had obtained both her own consent and that of Wilfred. After this, a conversation took place, which was, as nearly as I can recollect, as follows. You may take my child, Mynheer Kranz, and my blessing with her, and I shall then leave you and seek some other habitation. It matters little where. Why not remain here, Wilfred? No, no, I am called elsewhere. Let that suffice, and ask no more questions. You have my child. I thank you for her, and will duly value her, but there is one difficulty. I know what you would say. There is no priest here in this wild country. True, neither is there any law to bind. Still, must some ceremony pass between you to satisfy a father? Will you consent to marry her after my fashion? If so, I will marry you directly. I will replied my father. Then take her by the hand. Now, mynheer, swear. I swear, repeated my father. By all the spirits of the heart's mountains. Nay, why not by heaven, interrupted my father. Because it is not my humor, rejoined Wilfred. If I prefer that oath... Less binding, perhaps, than another. Surely you will not thwart me. Well, be it so then, have your humor. Will you make me swear by that in which I do not believe? Yet many do so, who in outward appearance are Christians, rejoined Wilfred. Say, will you be married, or shall I take my daughter away with me? Proceed replied my father impatiently. I swear by all the spirits of the heart's mountains, by all their power for good or for evil, that I take Christina for my wedded wife, that I will ever protect her, cherish her, and love her, and that my hand will never be raised against her to harm her. My father repeated the words after Wilfred. 
And if I fail in this my vow, may all the vengeance of the spirits fall upon me and upon my children. May they perish by the vulture, by the wolf, or other beasts of the forests. May their flesh be torn from their limbs and their bones blanch in the wilderness. All this I swear. My father hesitated as he repeated the last words. Little Marcella could not restrain herself, and as my father repeated the last sentence, she burst into tears. This sudden interruption appeared to discompose the party, particularly my father. He spoke harshly to the child, who controlled her sobs by burying her face under the bedclothes. Such was the second marriage of my father. The next morning, the hunter Wilfred mounted his horse and rode away. My father resumed his bed, which was in the same room as ours, and things went on much as before the marriage, except that our new stepmother did not show any kindness toward us. Indeed, during my father's absence, she would often beat us, particularly little Marcella, and her eyes would flash fire as she looked eagerly upon the fair and lovely child. One night, my sister awoke me and my brother. What is the matter? said Caesar. She has gone out, whispered Marcella. Gone out? Yes, gone out at the door in her night clothes, replied the child. I saw her get out of bed, look at my father to see if he slept, and then she went out at the door. What could induce her to leave her bed and all undressed to go out in such bitter wintry weather with the snow deep on the ground was to us incomprehensible. We lay awake, and in about an hour we heard the growl of a wolf close under the window. There is a wolf, said Caesar. She will be torn to pieces. Oh no, cried Marcella. In a few minutes afterwards, our stepmother appeared. She was in her nightdress, as Marcella had stated. She let down the latch of the door so as to make no noise, went to a pail of water, and washed her face and hands, and then slipped into the bed where my father lay. We all three trembled. We hardly knew why, but we resolved to watch the next night. We did so, and not only on the ensuing night, but on many others, and always at about the same hour would our stepmother rise from her bed and leave the cottage. And after she was gone, we invariably heard the growl of a wolf under our window and always saw her, on her return, wash herself before she retired to bed. We observed also that she seldom sat down to meals and that when she did, she appeared to eat with dislike. But when the meat was taken down to be prepared for dinner, she would often furtively put a raw piece into her mouth. My brother Caesar was a courageous boy. He did not like to speak to my father until he knew more. He resolved that he would follow her out and ascertain what she did. Marcella and I endeavored to dissuade him from this project, but he would not be controlled, and the very next night he lay down in his clothes, and as soon as our stepmother had left the cottage, he jumped up, took down my father's gun, and followed her. You may imagine in what a state of suspense Marcella and I remained during his absence. After a few minutes, we heard the report of a gun. It did not awaken my father, and we lay trembling with anxiety. In a minute afterwards, we saw our stepmother enter the cottage. Her dress was bloody. I put my hand to Marcella's mouth to prevent her crying out, although I myself was in great alarm. Our stepmother approached my father's bed, looked to see if he was asleep, and then went to the chimney and blew up the embers into a blaze. Who is there? said my father, waking up. Lie still, dearest, replied my stepmother. It is only me. I have lighted the fire to warm some water. I am not quite well. My father turned round and was soon asleep, but we watched our stepmother. She changed her linen and threw the garments she had worn into the fire, and we then perceived that her right leg was bleeding profusely, as if from a gunshot wound. She bandaged it up, then dressing herself, remained before the fire until the break of day. 
poor little Marcella, her heart beat quick as she pressed me to her side. So indeed did mine. Where was our brother, Caesar? How did my stepmother receive the wound unless from his gun? At last my father rose, and then, for the first time, I spoke, saying, Father, where is my brother, Caesar? Your brother, exclaimed he. Why, where can he be? Merciful heaven, I thought as I lay very restless last night, observed our stepmother, that I heard somebody open the latch of the door, and, dear me, husband, what has become of your gun? My father cast his eyes up above the chimney and perceived that his gun was missing. For a moment he looked perplexed, then, seizing a broad axe, he went out of the cottage without saying another word. He did not remain away from us long. In a few minutes he returned, bearing in his arms the mangled body of my poor brother. He laid it down and covered up his face. My stepmother rose up and looked at the body, while Marcella and I threw ourselves by its side, wailing and sobbing bitterly. "'Go to bed again, children,' said she sharply. "'Husband,' continued she, "'your boy must have taken the gun down to shoot a wolf, and the animal has been too powerful for him. Poor boy! He has paid dearly for his rashness.' My father made no reply. I wished to speak, to tell all, but Marcella, who perceived my intention, held me by the arm and looked at me so imploringly that I desisted. My father, therefore, was left in his error, but Marcella and I, although we could not comprehend it, were conscious that our stepmother was in some way connected with my brother's death. That day my father went out and dug a grave, and when he laid the body in the earth he piled up stones over it so that the wolf should not be able to dig it up. The shock of this catastrophe was to my poor father very severe. For several days he never went to the chase, although at times he would utter bitter anathemas and vengeance against the wolves. But during this time of mourning on his part, my stepmother's nocturnal wanderings continued with the same regularity as before. At last, my father took down his gun to repair to the forest, but he soon returned and appeared much annoyed. Would you believe it, Christina, that the wolves, perdition to the whole race, have actually contrived to dig up the body of my poor boy, and now there is nothing left of him but his bones? Indeed, replied my stepmother. Marcella looked at me, and I saw in her intelligent eye all she would have uttered. A wolf growls under our window every night, father, said I. I indeed? Why did you not tell me, boy? Wake me the next time you hear it. I saw my stepmother turn away. Her eyes flashed fire, and she gnashed her teeth. My father went out again, covering up with a larger pile of stones the little remnants of my poor brother which the wolves had spared. Such was the first act of the tragedy. The spring now came on. The snow disappeared, and we were permitted to leave the cottage, but never would I quit for one moment my dear little sister, to whom, since the death of my brother, I was more ardently attached than ever. Indeed, I was afraid to leave her alone with my stepmother, who appeared to have a particular pleasure in ill-treating the child. My father was now employed upon his little farm, and I was able to render him some assistance. Marcella used to sit by us while we were at work, leaving my stepmother alone in the cottage. I ought to observe that, as the spring advanced, so did my stepmother decrease her nocturnal rambles, and that we never heard the growl of the wolf under the window after I had spoken of it to my father. One day, when my father and I were in the field, Marcella being with us, my stepmother came out, saying that she was going into the forest to collect some herbs my father wanted, and that Marcella must go into the cottage and watch the dinner. Marcella went, and my stepmother soon disappeared in the forest, taking a direction quite contrary to that in which the cottage stood, and leaving my father and I, as it were, between her and Marcella. About an hour afterwards, we were startled by shrieks from the cottage, evidently the shrieks of little Marcella. "'Marcella has burnt herself, father,' said I, throwing down my spade. My father threw down his, and we both hastened to the cottage. 
Before we could gain the door, out darted a large white wolf, which fled with the utmost celerity. My father had no weapon. He rushed into the cottage and there saw poor little Marcella expiring. Her body was dreadfully mangled. The blood pouring from it had formed a large pool on the cottage floor. My father's first intention had been to seize his gun and pursue, but he was checked by this horrid spectacle. He knelt down by his dying child and burst into tears. Marcella could just look kindly on us for a few seconds, and then her eyes were closed in death. My father and I were still hanging over my poor sister's body when my stepmother came in. At the dreadful sight she expressed much concern, but she did not appear to recoil from the sight of blood, as most women do. Poor child, said she. It must have been that great white wolf which passed me just now and frightened me so. She's quite dead, Krantz. I know it, I know it, cried my father in agony. I thought my father would never recover from the effects of this second tragedy. He mourned bitterly over the body of his sweet child, and for several days would not consign it to its grave, although frequently requested by my stepmother to do so. At last he yielded, and dug a grave for her close by that of my poor brother, and took every precaution that the wolf should not violate her remains. I was now really miserable, as I lay alone in the bed which I had formerly shared with my brother and sister. I could not help thinking that my stepmother was implicated in both their deaths, although I could not account for the manner. But I no longer felt afraid of her. My little heart was full of hatred and revenge. The night after my sister had been buried, as I lay awake, I perceived my stepmother get up and go out of the cottage. I waited for some time, then dressed myself and looked out through the door, which I half opened. The moon shone bright, and I could see the spot where my brother and my sister had been buried. And what was my horror when I perceived my stepmother busily removing the stones from Marcella's grave. She was in her white night dress, and the moon shone full upon her. She was digging with her hands and throwing away the stones behind her with all the ferocity of a wild beast. It was some time before I could collect my senses and decide what I should do. At last I perceived that she had arrived at the body and raised it up to the side of the grave. I could bear it no longer. I ran to my father and awoke him. Father! Father! cried I. Dress yourself and get your gun! What? cried my father. The wolves are there, are they? He jumped out of bed, threw on his clothes, and, in his anxiety, did not appear to perceive the absence of his wife. As soon as he was ready, I opened the door. He went out, and I followed him. Imagine his horror when, unprepared as he was for such a sight, he beheld, as he advanced toward the grave, not a wolf, but his wife, in her nightdress, on her hands and knees, crouching by the body of my sister, and tearing off large pieces of the flesh, and devouring them with all the avidity of a wolf. She was too busy to be aware of our approach. My father dropped his gun, his hair stood on end, so did mine. He breathed heavily, and then his breath for a time stopped. I picked up the gun and put it into his hand. Suddenly he appeared as if concentrated rage had restored him to double vigor. He leveled his piece, fired, and with a loud shriek, down fell the wretch whom he had fostered in his bosom. God of heaven! cried my father, sinking down upon the earth with a swoon as soon as he had discharged his gun. I remained some time by his side before he recovered. Where am I? said he. What has happened? Oh, oh yes, I recollect now. Heaven forgive me. He rose, and we walked up to the grave. What again was our astonishment and horror to find that instead of the dead body of my stepmother, as we expected, there was, lying over the remains of my poor sister, a large, white she-wolf. The white wolf, exclaimed my father. The white wolf which decoyed me into the forest. I see it all now. I have dealt with the spirits of the heart's mountains. For some time my father remained in silence and deep thought. 
He then carefully lifted up the body of my sister, replaced it in the grave, and covered it over as before, having struck the head of the dead animal with the heel of his boot, and, raving like a madman, he walked back to the cottage, shut the door, and threw himself on the bed. I did the same, for I was in a stupor of amazement. Early in the morning we were both roused by a loud knocking at the door, and in rushed the hunter Wilfred. "'My daughter! Man! My daughter! Where is my daughter?' cried he in a rage. "'Where the wretch, the fiend, should be, I trust,' replied my father, starting up and displaying equal choler. "'Where she should be, in hell! Leave this cottage, or you may fare worse.' "'Ha! <laughs> Ha!' replied the hunter. "'Would you harm a potent spirit of the heart's mountains? "'Poor mortal, who must needs wed a werewolf!' Out, demon, I defy thee in thy power. Yet shall you feel it. Remember your oath, your solemn oath, never to raise your hand against her to harm her. I made no compact with evil spirits. You did, and if you failed in your vow, you were to meet the vengeance of the spirits. Your children were to perish by the vulture, the wolf, out, out, demon! And their bones blanch in the wilderness. <laughs> My father, frantic with rage, seized his axe and raised it over Wilfred's head to strike. All this I swear, continued the huntsman mockingly. The axe descended, but... It passed through the form of the hunter, and my father lost his balance and fell heavily on the floor. Mortal, said the hunter, striding over my father's body. We have power over those only who have committed murder. You have been guilty of a double murder. You shall pay the penalty attached to your marriage vow. Two of your children are gone, the third is yet to follow, and follow them he will, for your oath is registered. Go, it were kindness to kill thee. Your punishment is that you live. The best sentence in this story is, Poor mortal who must needs wed a werewolf. It's the first and only time the words werewolf appear in this story, and it's perfect punctuation for that moment. I need to mention two brief editorial changes I made. Firstly, I removed some of the more explicit aspects of the sufferings of little Marcella at the hands of the adults in her life. I thought that they were unnecessary for the story, and that leaving them in may merit a trigger warning. It only amounted to a few sentence fragments, a total of 17 words, and the point of the story for me is the mood and the werewolf and not the fleeting mentions of child abuse. Also, I don't know exactly how the YouTube auto-moderating thing works. I'm not so worried about having a video be demonetized, but not over something as trivial as that. Secondly, Marriott uses the term mother-in-law throughout the story when Christina is not the mother-in-law. She's the stepmother. I have no idea why he did this. He was a native English speaker born in Westminster. Those terms have not evolved or changed meanings in the past 200 years. It drove me crazy, so I just changed it. Public domain, baby! This book was written under the pseudonym H.D. Marriott by author Frederick Marriott. As I mentioned, he was born in London in 1792, and he was apparently obsessed with the sea from a very young age. He kept trying to run away to be a sailor until, at the age of 14, he was allowed to enlist in the Royal Navy. He served on a bunch of different ships. He was eventually deployed to North America, where he took part in a battle, and he was promoted to commander just at the end of the War of 1812. After the war, he spent a few years as a kind of analyst. He invented a new type of lifeboat, which earned him a medal. He developed a new method of maritime flag signaling, which was used throughout the 19th century. He described a new species of sea snail. He got married, and eventually he had seven children. 
In 1820, he returned to life at sea, and he commanded a few ships in different missions, none of which were especially successful or prestigious. In 1829, he published his first novel, and so in 1830, he retired from the Navy and became a full-time author. So, for about 10 years, he wrote various nautical adventures and travelogues, most of them based loosely on his own experiences, and they were very successful. Uh, English people were very proud of their navy, and this was just at the beginning of the Victorian era when people heavily romanticized adventure and exploration and so forth. I mean, people still do that, uh, but for Victorian England, it was deeply connected to their ideas of empire and their prestige. Anyway, his books did very well. Then, in 1839, he wrote The Phantom Ship, a kind of gothic novel about the legend of the Flying Dutchman. Now, that book did not go over well at all, and people complained that he made a very exciting topic boring and repetitive, that his writing is slipshod and careless. The book has been called cumbersome and even appalling. This story, however, is a chapter in that book, and it has appeared independently in a number of different horror anthologies since it was first published. Speaking of slipshod, there are no Hartz Mountains in Germany, although there are Haars Mountains near Hanover. In his final novel, Children of the New Forest, it was his best-received novel, Marriott wrote about the real-life Arnwood Manor, but he also misspelled that by one letter, so is that just a thing he did? Anyway, it's against the backdrop of critics calling the book slipshod and poorly written that I felt more comfortable revising the term mother-in-law to stepmother, by the way. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. Tonight's confession is that I was feeling bad because I have all of these physical books waiting to be read, and all these books that I want to reread, and I'm kind of hung up on a graphic novel a friend sent me and wants me to read. And I mean, I love my friend, but this is a 185-page PDF, which is a bit daunting. And I was feeling bad for not reading it, or reading enough in general, and I was completely forgetting how much I read constantly for this channel. I think because I'm reading online, mostly in archive.org, it doesn't kind of feel like proper reading. It looks more like working or like all the other things I do online, but it really is reading. And I have read so, so, so many books. Lots of books with stories that I just didn't like. Lots of books with only one or two stories that I like. Sometimes one or two stories that I like, but they just don't work on the channel. I've read about 50 books so far this year, although I didn't finish all of them. Sometimes I didn't get engaged in the book, so I start to kind of skim and then I move on to something else. It can actually be something of a challenge to find a story that's in the public domain that is about the right length for me to make a video that doesn't have accessibly objectionable content or language that I genuinely like and want to share, and I need to find two of them every week. I feel a certain sense of triumph when I find a good one. I want to, like, bring them to you and share them like a, like a trophy or something. That is one reason why there's kind of a temptation to stay with certain authors. Last year, I read an absolutely incredible story, and I was so psyched to record it, and I had the script all written before I started researching the author, only to find out that he was a really, really really loathsome human being whose legacy I didn't want to contribute to, so I had to scrap the whole thing. Anyway, I'm about halfway through this enormous PDF, and I will apologize to my friend for not finishing it sooner, but I do have a good excuse. I am reading all the time. If you need a good excuse to read or not to read, subscribe to the channel. As I just said, I search through old books and I find odd, interesting stories to share with you and you wouldn't want to miss anything. Please also drop me a like or a comment, share this video if you think it's worth sharing, and help support the channel. Thank you so much for sticking around and I will see you in a few days.